We are going to talk about SQL today, and I'm going to cover a lot of ground, but I put down fairly uh, extensive uh, course notes, and we are going to do SQL again on Thursday. So today we are going to do uh, uh, SQL, kind of the simple part of SQL, and then on Thursday we are going to see all sorts of uh, extra stuff that you don't necessarily need. So this is one of the first things is that I want you to be a master of learning how to write simple SQL. But once there you find that there are things that you cannot write. I'm sorry? To talk to me? So once you learn that you know you cannot uh, write some sort of you know like edge cases, there are a lot of advanced features. But, you know, once you learn the advanced features, you want to use them all the time because they make your life easier. But that doesn't mean they are necessarily the best. And I will talk about why sometimes it is better not to use these extra features because, of, you know, it has to do with query optimization and portability and lots of things like that. So, in fact, when I first learned uh, SQL, I was very excited to be able to write super complex queries, okay? And this is kind of what we do, right? When we learn something, we are excited. We can do some extra, extra complicated things. It's great for our brain. But in fact, I want you to see simplicity as much as possible. Write the simpler queries first, and then get fancy only when that doesn't solve your problem, okay? So what are we going to do today is we are going to learn some programmatic extensions, but for the most part, whatever I do here is going to be the same thing you can do with relational algebra. Okay, everything we learned in relational algebra, the extension with the, the group by and aggregation, more or less, is what we will do today. So if you cannot figure out how to do something, think about how you would do it in relational algebra and try to convert it back here. Okay, so SQL is a programming language, so it has a lot of different things like data types and type conversions and a lot of these things you're going to experiment with. And I don't need to really go through all of them, but I will talk about some of the basic ideas. And one of the things that I was talking about last time was get in the habit of testing everything. If you don't install a database on your own machine, so you can install it on your own machine, PSQL is the one I like to use. Uh, we have opened the port to actually use the um, database server on the cloud. Um, so you can actually use PSQL to connect to a remote server as well. Uh, RPI, is it cloudnet.app or cloudapp.net, one of these two. And you can describe which database you want. For example, you can con connect the university database. Okay. So if you find the PHP PJ admin un unexciting to use, you can install a PSQL on your own machine without having the database, and this will connect directly to the server. Okay. Um, so this is, in fact, uh, an older version, because this machine is older. But if you were to install it on your machine, you will probably get PSQL 9.5. And uh, generally, it should not be a problem for the queries that we do. So this is the data set that I put in. We were talking about it in class. Um, the only thing is that you should not be able to create tables on this uh, database. So if you want to create tables to test things, you have to create your own database. And eventually, we will create one for everybody. But just for simplicity, I'm going to use my own um, server here. Okay. So one of the things we learned, we started very simple, is that the simple SQL has select from where statement. And then it actually flows from to where and then to select. Okay, This will become very important later on. So I'm going to go through every single one quickly, but uh, in somewhat detail. 
So in select, you basically are doing a projection. So whatever you select, you basically select some number of attributes from a relation. And in the where statement, you have set of conditions, Boolean conditions, that tell you what to select. So Boolean conditions. We said that the idea is that it tells you to look at every tuple in the relation, check if it satisfies the Boolean conditions, then return these tuples to select, and then construct some projection attributes and return those. So we can go to our table. This is the student's table that I manually created for a show that none of you watch, I think. Um, OK, so, so if you say select star from, it means return all the attributes. It's not something we do, but obviously this does not actually have the data in it. So let's go to the one on the cloud. Oh, yes, because this is actually a different computer than the one I was using. All right, so, OK. So these are all the students in my database. If I wanted to return a certain subset of them, um, I can basically say return name and email. If I wanted to return, for example, a column saying that these are students, this is just instant adding a new column that says that you know this column has the specific constant like extended um, projection. You can rename a column by writing as. So. Many databases will not require you to have the keyword as. It will still work even if you don't. But I believe the standard is to have as. So, you know, it's better to use whatever is the standard so that whatever you write is uh, accessible. So not only that, you can actually do things that, um, you know, operate on these attributes. Like, for example, you can take a string and make it uppercase. You can take two fields, and then you can concatenate them. Okay. Obviously, that is not great. So what I can do is I can maybe concatenate with a uh, value in between and give this a name. Okay. You can have, um, you can repeat the same column, but you probably uh, have to, um, look, you don't even have to give the different name. Um, so this is kind of the general idea. You can do many, many things in select. That is, basically, you are limited by all the functions that is provided. So go to the Postgres documentation and see what you can do, OK? So very often, you will have an expression that will return you a value. And then you basically have to rename it as something else. So that's basically the idea of select. Any questions? So that is simple, OK? The where statement is a little bit more interesting. So in the where statement, you can have any condition over the attributes in that relation. So the where condition is actually the selection. So this is the selection from relational algebra. This is the projection from relational algebra, which is kind of confusing. But so there it is. Okay. So you can have all sorts of conditions that you would like. So for example, you can say where um, name is equal to So this is kind of an interesting point to make here. So if I, if I were to write 
Okay, select upper name as name from students where name is equal to Elliot. Okay, you see that this name is the name actually stored in students, not the one that is made uppercase because that comes after, right? So for what's stored in the database, you check a condition. Depending on the outcome, you construct a new value, which is the uppercase name. Even though, so that is the last thing that I produce. So as these are strings, you can do regular expressions on them. So you can search for regular expressions. So you can say, instead of searching that name is equal to something, you can search that name is like a regular expression. So like this one. So the percent will match with um, zero or more values, whereas um, underscore will match with a single value. So this is zero or more, and this is one. And you have to use like. You cannot use equal, because if you're using equal, you're searching for the string that has a percentage in it. If you're searching for uh, the regular expression, that means any string that starts with Elliot and has some other characters, you have to use like. So I can do the same here. But instead of saying name is equal, I can say name is like. this, or that I can say um, that the name starts with a Q, or a name has an A in it. <coughs> now, since you can do this, doesn't mean you should always do a regular expression. So you can do a regular expression doesn't mean that uh, that is the right thing. Okay, I guess I said the same thing exactly the same way twice. Um, <laughs> so one of the things is that uh, to check a regular expression, it actually has to read the whole string and then check if it is true. And it is not really that easy to um, index for regular expressions. So if you uh, know that the name is a specific name, then you should search for the identical name, not a regular expression, unless there is a name, there is a reason for it. In the same way, if you know something is uppercase, then you don't want to make uppercase in search because that's going to actually make it difficult to use some indices. So um, the other thing that is kind of interesting is uh, null values. So for example, If you look at the table for students, it says that, for example, each student must have a name and an email. Those values cannot be null. But the address can be null, and the GPA can be null. Right? So null means that there is no value. But in fact, I'm going to store an explicit value called null. So it is not a uh, specific empty string. It is actually a value called null. And null can mean many different things. For example, you may not have an address here as null because why? I don't store an address for you because do you all have to have do you all have to write an address to start here? Because your address may be changing. You may I may not know what it is, right? Um, but the GPA has to be null because Freshmen don't have GPA, right? So that's, these are different things. So that you basically have two separate reasons for nulls. Let's write them down here. So, so you can have nulls because there is no value, like GPA. You can also have nulls because I don't know what the value is. Or 
or sometimes I don't even know whether a value exists or not. Okay? I don't know if you have a uh, landline phone or not, right? You may or may not. So kind of null is an overall catch-all for all of those. You know, some people have told that there should be different kinds of nulls, but that's not implemented. But you do have a specific value that is null. And in fact, if you were to uh, select, for example, two students have no GPA, right? So if you wanted to search and find students who have no GPA, you cannot say GPA is equal to null. So um, you cannot say where uh, GPA is equal to null. This is a thing that some people find kind of ir irritating and annoying, but it is the way it is. Because the point is that null is not a value. Something is null means that it has no value. So you cannot check if it is equal to something or not. You can only check if it is null by this keyword is null. Okay. And you can also check something is not null. So, for example, what if I want to check if GPA is greater than 2? Okay. None of these GPA are great less than 2, are less than 2. None of these are less than 2. How about those two that are null? Are they less than 2? <coughs> I don't know, right? So, um, I don't know. It could be or it could not be. It's just that it does not exist, right? And there is no condition you can write that will return a null value. Right, so you cannot say is uh, not equal to um, 2.5. Right, it will never return the null value. So the null value can only return true if you check explicitly is null or is not null. So think of it as follows. So whenever you have a condition that basically involves a null value, something like null is equal to 5 or null is greater than 5, they actually don't return true or false. What they return is unknown. Okay. The reason why it's unknown is that unknown is itself works like a false, right? So if something is unknown, I will not return it in the statement because I don't know for sure if it's true or false. But there are lots of things that may be in the same condition. So I may have two conditions, C1 and C2. Then I need to worry about if one of them is unknown or not. So if I have one of these return unknown, so GPA is greater than 5, and let's say name is equal to something, and this is true. What would be unknown and true? Unknown. If I had unknown and false, this is false. Because regardless of what the other one is, this will always be false. If you do, in fact, do unknown and unknown, it is unknown. For all practical purposes, unknown actually acts like a false because you are not going to return it unless you know for sure it is true. But it is kind of a good mental uh, exercise. There is, in fact, logic for unknown values. Uh, sometimes people represent unknown as like this. So you also do have the same deal with R. So unknown or true is unknown or true? True, right. So only one of them has to be true. 
unknown or false is unknown, right? If this is true, this will be true, unknown or unknown is also unknown, okay? So keep that in mind, and most importantly, not of unknown is also unknown. All right. <coughs> so this is now going to be a new challenge. Every time you write a query, you have to remember if that attribute can be null, and whether I should return when it is null or not null. Right? So uh, if I wanted to return all students, Okay, whether they are, uh, they have a GPA or, so let's say I wanted to return students with no GPA or GPA of 3.5 or higher, right? So I would have to write something like, GPA is greater than or equal to 3.5 or GPA is null. <laughs> Something like this. So, and this is how I expect that is uh, the best way to work, is to kind of have an editor on one side, and, um, interesting. I don't know why we are having this. I guess we are already, are you on the server right now, some of you? All right, while we are doing this, I'm going to go and uh, restart this. Let's use my local computer here. I have some connectivity issues there. So let's try the same thing. Okay. So um, the same thing is uh, also we're going to talk about in the where statement. You can have many expressions, and these expressions may actually involve uh, complex data types. So um, we have learned the basic data types. You have integer, string. You know, you know what to do with them. There is all sorts of basic string operations that you find in any language. So you can um, you can uh, you know find where the location of something. You can take substring. You can take upper uppercase, lowercase string. <laughs> And you can do, bless you, you can do um, arithmetic on numbers. There's lots of built-in functions that you can see. So just to show you a few of these, for example, you can do um, sine of 45, you, all trigonometric functions. You can do square root of 4. Okay. Um, you can do um, uppercase and lowercase of strings. You can cast values. So you can cast a, uh, let's say, long digit as a two digit value. This you will need for the homework. So there's a lot of operations like this. Any operation that takes a single value and returns a single value, you can use in the where clause. So, you know, you can write something like, <coughs> where, you know, where SQRT of GPA is, it makes no sense, but let's just do greater than or equals to, right? Um, so, 
But the other things that are more interesting that you can do is you can do date arithmetic. So uh, we have a date data type that basically returns you an object of type date. And um, so, for example, what is now? So this is a string that has a date in it, right? Whereas this is an actual date data type. If you have date data types, you can do a few things. You can actually compare dates to each other. So you can say, um, so let's find a, uh, so there is actually a date value here. Oh, I didn't put in dates there. Um, there's no date here. There's no date here. What else we have? Courses have date? No. All right. I thought that I had some date values. Well, what can I do? So, um, the things that we can do dates are quite interesting. So we have three basic data types. One is a date, something like today. In fact, the leap day, it's actually kind of a special day, which will not be handled as you wish. So a date basically is a specific date of the year. You can have a time, which basically is a time of day. And you can choose the format that you use. The default way is to actually have the military time. So you can have, for example, 2 o'clock. And the third data type is a timestamp. Which basically has both of them. So you can have. 2016, 02, 29, 14, 29, 00, okay. Now what you can do is you can compare dates among each other with greater than or less than. So you can check, for example, if a date is greater than another date. And you can do the same with time. You can do the same with time and timestamp. And it will not allow you to do this depending on which version of Postgres you use. Uh, it will not, or it will, convert between data types. Overall, you can, you can assume that it's not going to take something date and timestamp and escalate the date to timestamp. It generally doesn't want to do lots of these internal things because it doesn't want to change the meaning of the query or catch when you have uh, a bad query. You can also find, you can also do arithmetic with dates. So you can take two dates and subtract one from the other, which will give you what? Number of days, okay? So you have to check. And I've had different output with each of the, uh, so I have, you know, I have four different versions or five different versions of Postgres in every single machine I have from 9.0 to 9.5. And every one of them is slightly different. So you have to check what that is. For example, you can find the number of days between uh, the final exam and today. So you can say uh, the final exam is on uh, May 19, was it? Yep. And then you can do uh, today, bless you, okay, 
days to go. Is that correct? Okay. So you have to be careful, though. Sometimes it will actually not do an exact calculation. It will just count a month as exactly 30 days. Okay. So don't use this as, as this may not be as accurate as you would get, let's say, in C++. Okay. Um, but it will give you a general idea. You can do things like, for example, you can take a date and then you can add a time to it. What would be the output data type? It will be a timestamp, right? So what if you take two timestamps? and subtract one from the each other. Bless you. Let's do this. <coughs> yeah, it's fine. So it will give you a new data type called time interval. Okay, so there is actually a fourth data type called an interval, which is generally something in terms of years, days, um, minutes, etc. Okay, so for example, you can write queries such as this. So you can say select from um, I think the requires actually has timestamps. Okay. So in fact, requires has um, timestamp. So what you can do is you can say something like from requires select star where. Um, Let's say today is 2016 to 29 minus enforced since. So it's two dates. You subtract one from the other, you're going to get days is uh, greater than equal to 200. Okay. So we'll try the various versions of this. So if I were to write 800, only one of them. Now, technically this should work, but it doesn't always work. Okay. It doesn't allow because depending on which version you use, sometimes it actually returns you an interval, sometimes just returns you an integer. Okay. So you have to be careful, but whenever you do timestamp minus timestamp, it will return you an interval. So, um, so. So this was returning an interval. Then you can check to see if, uh, for example, you can take this and then you can subtract an interval from this. Okay, this probably will not work because uh, now it does work. There we go. It's negative interval. Okay. So there's a lot of kind of data arithmetic, but you have to kind of test and see what it actually works. Um, so whenever you're subtracting interval to interval, it will, in timestamp to timestamp, it will return an interval, but other times I won't. All right. Um, so that is kind of all that I have for this. So now we're going to get fancy. I want to make sure that I didn't miss anything here. We talked about null values. Talked about date. All right, so now let's get a little bit more uh, fancy. Okay, so that was the select and where. Really, the more interesting thing is the from. Okay, so generally speaking, your queries will involve more than one relation. So from relation one, relation two, Relation three. Okay. 
And then you will have in the where statement conditions. These conditions actually fall into two specific categories. So the first set of categories will be join conditions. If you didn't have join conditions, what this really comes down to is a Cartesian product. So it says select from relation one and relation two and relation three means that first construct a Cartesian product, then from that apply some conditions. So the first conditions you should always see should be the join conditions. Then you can add other conditions that are additional selection conditions. Okay, remember that from here to here you're getting Cartesian product. So whenever I write queries, the first thing I do is I actually write Cartesian product in my mind and write the first join conditions, then I add other conditions. So some of you have seen various different ways to do different things, like you know that you can probably write join in the from statement, right? So um, for a second, just forget all that. For simplicity, we are going to just write join conditions in where. So the first thing we have to think about is the join conditions. Just to show you, OK. So this is my students and transcript. You have five rows and 15 rows. So if I were to say, yes, this would be a Cartesian product of how many tuples? Five times 15, 75, right? So the first thing you have to do is write the join condition between these two. And at this point, it becomes kind of easy to give these relations an alias. So let's say students S transcript T. And the first thing that I want to write is the join condition. And the join condition would be that the student, that the student ID is equal to the ID. So T dot student ID is equal to S dot ID. Okay, now I still, I only have 15 because I just did the join. Okay, and exactly like the join, you basically have every single attribute <coughs> unless you want to change things. Okay, so now let's actually write some interesting queries that uh, join across different things. Suppose I want to find all students in a class with a certain name. So let's write find name of students taking the class um, spellcasting. Okay. And let's add another one in spring 2016. So I want to find the name of all students taking the class spellcasting in spring 2016. Okay. The first thing you have to do is, okay, let's start with the from statement. And we have to list every single table we need for this query. So what do we need? We need students for names, right? Let's call that students S. So I need transcript to know who's taking which class. Right? So I need transcript T. What else? Do I, I need courses for the name of the course. Anything else? No, right? So this is kind of the general way. First, think about what you need. And you know, very often you will also say, let me throw in the classes, but you don't need classes because uh, semester and um, semester and year are also in transcript, so I don't need that. So now the first thing that I need to do is write the join conditions. So for example, 
s.id is t.student.id and t. course ID equals C dot ID, right? So this is the first thing I write. Then I ask, okay, what other conditions do I have? I have that the semester is spring and year is 2016 and the name of the class, is it C dot name? course name go spell casting okay and now now that I am mostly done I believe I write select s dot name okay now the next thing you ask yourself is it possible for a student to have multiple tuples that match this condition okay that has to do with the schema. You have to go back to the schema and to see if it is possible for a student to have multiple tuples returned by this. And you have to be aware of what you're doing. You cannot just throw in this thing just to make sure that I don't return duplicates because overall you will find this thing is actually expensive. So I don't want to really return duplicates, but I don't want to do this thing unless I have to. Okay. So this is kind of the thing that I want you to do whenever you write queries. Write all the, query, all the uh, information that you need, and then we can basically write the join conditions followed by the others. So let's find, find all students who have taken a class, who have, let's say, finished taking a class from Professor Finn. <coughs> Return their name and all right, let's just start with that and then we'll talk about other things. Does, do any of you watch the show? No. All right. That shows how popular it is. Okay. So what do I need? So I'm going to do the same thing. Okay. So for example, I'm going to return students, so I need students S. I need transcript because that's when I know what course they're taking. What else do I need? I need courses for, to find, is it, do I need courses? I don't need the name of the courses, but I need classes because that tells me who's, take, who's teaching that class, right? So I need classes C. Anything else? Faculty, because of the faculty name. Okay. And that's it, right? So, okay, now I have four relations. First thing I do is write the join conditions between them. Whatever does this, right? So you have, for example, t.studentid is equal to s.id and t. Dot, was it course ID? Uh, oh, this is going to be interesting. So let's look at the transcript and let's look at the classes, okay? So, uh, in fact, the primary key is course ID semester year and section, right? So if I want to find the same class, I actually have to join on all four attributes because those four attributes uniquely identify a class that a specific professor teaches, okay? You know, you will find that, my God, why do I have to write these four conditions? Because it builds character, okay? <laughs> I, I put that data model there just so that, remember, that when you're joining between two tables, you have to join all tuples that refer to that reason, right? So these four together is basically uh, what the prime, what the uh, foreign key is, right? So hey, so my foreign key is that these four actually reference the four in here. So I have to write all of them. So I'm going to write copy and paste here. So. Uh, 
Okay? So this is what it takes to join transcript to class, because that's how I refer to one. And then see that instructor ID is equal to f.id, right? So now I'm done with all my join conditions between these four tables, right? And in fact, just for mental effort, I go in the same order. So I started from S and T, then I did T and C, and then I did C and F. Doesn't always have to be a single chain, but I want to make sure I don't miss out something. And now I have the other things like that the faculty f dot name should be like uh, fin, some sort of fin character. Okay, and then I need to return the name of the student. And do I need a distinct here? Can there be multiple couples for each student? But if I took multiple classes from the same professor, right? So in that case, I will have multiple tuples. In that case, I need to make sure that I remove duplicates by putting the stink here. Now, one of the things that I want you to start thinking about is that this is not a well-formed query, right? So you say select the stink name, but name is not guaranteed to be unique in a database, right? Because I said that the ID of a student is unique, but there are people with the same name but different students, right? So in this case, I'm going to remove both of them. If there are two, I will give you one tuple. So what I would like to do is, instead of this, I want to make sure that I do not eliminate, you know, even though I ask you the name, obviously if you have two students with the same name, you should return two values. So in that case, I'm going to include the ID just to make sure that this is correct. Okay. And nobody is taking, so... That could mean multiple things. Oh, and also, we said who have finished taking a class, right? So if somebody finished taking a class, then their grade should not be, is not null. Clearly, this is not working because we have not chosen the right faculty. So, one, two, three, four, five. So there should be actually a faculty. So let's see what we did wrong. There is no fin. So that will explain. All right. Fog. I apparently am not watching it as closely as well. Okay. What? Okay. That could very well be because of this, that the grade is not now. So let's see, maybe Falk has taught only one class. Okay, all right, so that's probably why. So you can check to see if there is another professor, let's say um, Mayakovsky, or let's, let's choose uh, March. Okay, now one of the things that I want to show you is how I'm debugging this, right? So when it, whenever you write a query, bless you, that doesn't return you something, Do a couple of things. First, write a simple query to look at what you have been doing. Okay. And then remove certain conditions to do sanity check. The second thing you do is, okay, first do a few simple queries to find what IDs should return, right? This is always a sanity check. Don't really look at, you know, a query kind of blindly to see what it's doing, but actively remove and add things to figure out where the error is, right? Um, so, for example, when I was looking at the uh, answers for the homework, there was one query that didn't return anything, and I looked at it for like 10 minutes. It turns out that I was one joint condition was review ID is equal to business ID, which of course will never be true, right? But the point is that blindly looking doesn't help. You have to keep adding and removing things and checking like this, okay? So, 
this is one example. I want to write one more example, then give a break. So, you know, this is actually the most important part of SQL. Just think about what you're doing, what relations need to be joined, and then write the join conditions, okay? Now I'm going to write a different one, um, but this will actually help you with one of the homework questions, okay? So, I want to find name of all students who have taken a class with Quentin somebody, Coldwater, okay? So this is, you know, one of the very simple queries that you are going to have to write. And you, I want you to think about this, how you would write it. Just draw a little diagram of what relations you have to join to find this, okay? And uh, what the conditions are. And you can say who have taken a class or have completed a class, right? <laughs> Both are fine, okay? So I'm going to stop here, and then when we come back after a five-minute break, I will solve this. But try to think about how you would solve it. What is the sequence <coughs> of uh, joins you have to do to get there? And this will become kind of important as we write more complex things. So let's give a five minute break and then we'll continue from there. <laughs> 